we have Anne Applebaum, who as a historian has done, I think, some of the most important historical work on, on this region. Um, and then in her, in her role as a staff writer at The Atlantic has, over the past several months, offered a steady stream of some of the most important and influential commentary on this war and its consequences. And we also have Mikhailo Podoliak. I apologize for the inelegant pronunciation, but I hope that's close. Uh, he was early in his career a journalist and the newspaper editor relevantly to this discussion. He is also a key advisor in the office of the president of Ukraine, who has been a key player in shaping and implementing uh, the information strategy that I think has been quite successful over the course of this war so far. I, I was going to start off today with a long and eloquent discussion of why this topic was so important, but President Zelensky really made that unnecessary yesterday when, as most of you probably remember, he stressed that the weaponization of disinformation is going to be one of the key challenges for Ukraine going forward in this war. So I won't, won't linger on it uh, other than to say I think that information is a, a key dimension in any war. That's, that's been true certainly for the age of modern war. It's been particularly interesting and complicated now. And I think some of the strategies you've seen from Ukraine, from the United States, from other players have been particularly innovative. So there'll be a lot to talk about today. But uh, Mikhailo, I wanna, I wanna start with you. I really wanna go back to those days around February 24th. And I want, want, want you to tell us how you and your colleagues and President Zelensky saw the challenge, saw the task for you as communicators, as source of information, how the strategy came together, and how you would characterize the strategy for us today. Um, no, you know, uh, it would be premature to tell the war is won already because from what we see, Russia has, uh, Russia's trends, they've started shifting them. Uh, they're not, no longer as brutal as they were at the beginning. Uh, in terms of the beginning of the war, we had some understanding of the Russian narratives and how to deal with them because Russia is still dwelling back in 2014, being the prisoner of its own standards, informational standards, uh, still thinking of Ukraine as a completely pro-Russian nation, ill-equipped, ill-provided in terms of the living standards, uh, still very much sure of Ukraine's inability to mount any meaningful uh, resistance to Russian army. Uh, one component that was a bit surprising and shocking for us was the complete lack of understanding across Europe of the current Russia being exactly not the one they used to think of, that it is much weaker, that it is never investing enough in technological advancement, into the personnel, that this is really a big, big bubble, huge bubble that was pumped also with assistance from the Western media. And it was shocking for us that the Western elites really were thinking you know, that Ukraine would fold up in a matter of days and that the Ukrainians, 70, maybe 80 percent of them, will be just as happy greeting the Russian tanks, meeting them in national embroidered uh, shirts. And, you know, uh, we were able to witness the shock that uh, Western elites have found themselves in because they could not comprehend how to react to the developments they were witnessing here. And we couldn't see this active position, this active stance that appeared days after when the Europe we know of today appeared, and when we see, uh, you know, after the developments uh, we have in Kharkiv direction, in this legendary now southern direction, you know, see completely different Europe, with, which is strongly convinced that Ukraine is well able to win. So before there was an idea how to, uh, to never let Ukraine to lose at least strategically, with clear understanding it may lose technically, uh, technically, and that some kind of new Minsk agreements may have to be uh, churned out, some sort of uh, 
pacification. That was at the beginning. Now we are glad to see a complete overhaul of the European position because now Europe says that Russia can lose. And I think it's a huge booster also for us, for our guys. And this will create a completely different security situation in Europe in general. The, the information and communications dimension of that. President Zelensky, of course, um, released those uh, incredibly compelling videos to the whole world early in the days of the war. He spent an enormous amount of time speaking both to the Ukrainian people and to audiences around the world. Uh, was it clear to you at the beginning of the war that releasing those kinds of videos, sending those kinds of messages, devoting so much time to communications was essential? How did that come together? Well, from in terms of public relations, uh, uh, would be hard to say that we already knew it from scratch. It was an intuition, you know. We thought with the president uh, how to positive yourself to, to present yourself, how to break away from this negative trend to avoid you know, people being completely frustrated, not knowing what to do. It was just intuitively clear that, you know, we have also to work with the public opinion in the West. It was important to show them that Ukraine will stand to the last, to the last point. And it was the image of the president who really broke the standards of classic real politic. Uh, when people say something in public to tell completely different things, um, you know, on the margins of an event. So the president opted for a very direct way of telling exactly what we need, in a way how we need it, and probably uh, during first days it was, it was perceived a bit hard, as uh, something harsh against the accepted etiquette, but it also created immediate feeling that we can be heard. And Ukraine was able ultimately to win back its position as information-rich country. Because really, before that, many of our current partners would think of us as a province in the underbelly of Russia. And they would even think that Russia can well put its own requirements for the region on its own. And then those quite aggressive at the beginning, but very strong messages from the president showed that Russia is no longer or has never been able to dictate. Uh, and that really created the basic tenets of this information uh, campaign that we are having for about 200 days. This is not to tell that the war will end just tomorrow, but we are telling uh, adequate things and how Russia is inadequate. So this is really a possibility for us to see another shape of the EU and the Euro European security. Also thanks to for Ukraine. You have for a long time chronicled Russian disinformation efforts and you've been I think one of the people in the US certainly who has done the most to clarify what they're doing to, to stress the importance of it. The Kremlin has traditionally been known as a sort of master of disinformation. I think we've been reckoning with that in the United States for the last several years. How, how, how do you see the playbook in the context of this war? And do you see Ukraine and the US and their partners as having found their own playbook to counter that effectively? So what's really important to understand about Russian disinformation is that it's based on the idea of undermining the, the very idea of truth. In other words, what did the Russians do after downing that Malaysian airline in, in eastern Ukraine in 2014? And what did they do actually after the attempt to poison Skripal, the, the, the Russian former agent in, in the UK? They didn't just deny it. They didn't say, we didn't do it. Instead, what they did was they put out, in the case of the airliner, literally dozens of different messages and different explanations. You'll remember there was one that said, you know, the Ukrainians shot down the plane because they were aiming at Putin. There was another bizarre version that someone had put up a plane full of corpses and exploded it on purpose in order to embarrass the Russians. 
with around the Skripal case, there were the same kinds of messages. You know, Skripal had tried to commit suicide. You know, a local um, um, MI6 agent in, was jealous. I mean, the, uh, sort of ranging from the maybe probable. We uh, with. Uh, um мало ймовірного до цілком неймовірного. Вони намагалися space. Um and the point of doing that was um was to create the idea that we don't know what happened and we will never know what happened. Uh and I actually saw it was a, a very well done um I think it was uh, Radio Svoboda uh, did a did a series of interviews on the street in Moscow a few days after the Malaysian airliner crash and they asked ordinary Russians on the street you know, who shot down the plane. And that was the most common answer. We don't know and we will never know because it's impossible to know. So they create this, they create the sense that nothing is knowable. You know, nothing is true and everything is possible as a, as a friend of mine entitled his book. Um, what's really important about the Ukrainian response to disinformation into going to the war, and I should say also the Western response, um, is that it's attempted to counter that. And so, I mean, even aesthetically, President Zelensky speaking to in, into his own cell phone outside of his office on a street that everybody recognizes and speaking with some kind of emotion, you know, whenever that was, two or three days after the invasion, was really important because it was a counter way of communicating. It was clear that it was him, he was speaking from his heart, he was in a recognizable place with recognizable people, I believe you were there as well. Um, and, and that created a dynamic, whereas on the one hand, you know, the Russians tell us all these complicated stories, on the other hand, the Ukrainians tell us one story, they do it clearly, they don't use sophisticated technology, and they speak in a direct way. And this was very, very important in establishing Ukrainian credibility. And again, I don't know whether this was a spontaneous reaction, um, whether um, Zelensky, because he's very good at television and he's surrounded by television producers himself, uh, had, a, had a sense of this. Um, but, but it also worked because it was true. In other words, he was speaking the truth and he was speaking in a simple way and directly. Um, and that, as a, as a counterpoint to Russian propaganda, is extremely important. Um, one other aspect of this, um, I went to interview Zelensky at the beginning of April, right after, not that long after the Russian withdrawal from north of Kiev. And I went with my editor and so on, and we met the president in, in his offices. And one of the first things that we all noticed that struck all of us was the fact that Zelensky was almost acting like the opposite of Putin. In other words, when you see Putin in photographs and when you see him being interviewed, you remember these long table, it's very formal, you know, people kind of bow and scrape to him as they walk into the room. Um, you know, he makes these pronouncements. And of course, from his point of view, that's also designed to create an impression of power, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't create the impression of truth telling. It doesn't make people believe him. And one of the things that Zelensky did when he met us, and again, I didn't think this was staged, it was spontaneous, you know, he walked in the room kind of complaining, and then he sat down and he said, oh, my back hurts, you know? And, you know, he, he immediately addresses you like, I'm a normal person, I happen to be in this weird position, you know, they elected me president, but I'm no different from you, you know, and I'm a, I'm a person like you, and this immediately creates the feeling of trust and belief. Um, and because the Ukrainians have been able to do that in these different spheres, because Zelensky himself is so good at doing that, and can even do it over Zoom, you know, when, when speaking to, to different countries, that's given um, at least Western audiences this sense of faith and belief in Ukraine that might not have been there before. Um, and I'll, although I accept actually what you were just, um, uh, Mr. Poliak was saying previously about the Westerners not believing in Ukraine or having faith in Ukraine, I don't think it was because they thought um, you know, the Ukrainians would give up and they were all really pro-Russian. It was more that they hadn't seen communications from the Ukrainian government that felt that clear before. Maybe they weren't listening. But, but, the, but the, the communications since the war began have worked for this reason, because they're informal, 
because they're direct um, and because they appear to be attached to some kind of emotion. And it's been, it's been very successful in Europe and in North America, and maybe we can talk later about whether it's worked so well in the rest of the world. Uh, I, I want to focus a bit on the, the, the U.S. dimension of this. You have a lot of people in the Biden administration who I think spent several years learning the lessons of, of 2014 and the failures of U.S. policy in 2014 of the 2016 election and thinking a lot about the U.S. role in combating Russian disinformation. And the key change that they made, of course, was the quick release of American intelligence. This started months before the war. It was an effort to say, we know what the Russians are up to, we see what you're doing. And I think to also uh, shape the information battle space so that the Russians couldn't confuse it. Uh, Anne, let me start with you. How important was that in setting the stage for what's happened since February 24th? So this also was, this is another aspect, this is not for the Ukrainians, but another, another reason why there's a certain amount of trust in the, you know, the Western descriptions of what's happening in the war is precisely because of this. And you're right that the decision to release this intelligence early was born out of a deeper understanding of how Russian disinformation works and also the expectation that whatever the Russians did, whether it was a full-scale invasion or just a small invasion, there would be lies about it that would have to be countered. Um, and this, too, has been a learning process. So, again, um, you know, in, in 2014, 2015, when you spoke about Russian disinformation in Washington, people would say, oh, well, that sounds like a very bad problem for Slovakia. You know, we're very sorry that Slovenia is subject to this problem of Russian disinformation, and it's, you know, very difficult, and you know, we'll have to come up with a problem to counter it. But the idea that Russian information could affect Washington and America and the West only happened after 2016. And after the 2016 election, there was much broader understanding, um, even among people who claim not to believe it, that, that Russian disinformation works, and a much better understanding of how it works. And so one of the reasons why Americans were better prepared in 2022 is they watched how it worked in in 2016. Um, I know that the decision to release intelligence early was among some controversial. There was a debate about whether this was a good idea or not. It would reveal maybe sources and so on. Um, but again, I think the idea was to um, both to begin creating the coalition around Ukraine before the war started. Um, and again, the idea was to preempt whatever story the Russians would make up about their reasons for invading. Um, if it didn't entirely work before the war, it's partly because the idea of U.S. intelligence was discredited um, because of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, if it's working better now, it's be in fact, it's almost, I'm almost worried now that people believe too much U.S. intelligence. I had a, I had a Belarusian say to me, it doesn't matter the details of it, but the, the, you know, they think the U.S. now knows things that I suspect the U.S. doesn't know. But, um, but the... The, the doubt, the, the, the idea was to establish some kind of American credibility, and I think that's also had an impact. You know, the Americans were right, um, even though very important Russians, including Lavrov, including leading members of the Russian um, elite, were going on television saying, ha ha, it's impossible, the CIA is lying to you, there won't be any invasion, and then there was, um, has also enhanced kind of American credibility and by, therefore, Ukrainian credibility as well. Mikhailo, can you tell us anything about that skepticism about U.S. intelligence before the war and the extent to which you see coordination on the information front between Ukraine and its, its partners uh, as, as working well now? How has that evolved since February 24th? <sighs> Let me uh, step, um, uh, uh, make two steps back. Uh, um, I'm not sure that it is possible to discuss these things during the active phase of war. There are three elements of a big campaign discrediting the Russian Federation. First, it's uh, this phenomenal story. They uh, really believe in their own propaganda. They're obsessed with it. They think that wooden armata is a powerful tank. They believe that they have the second army in the world. And this phenomenon was reflected in the West 
Western opinion mirroring it. So they also believe that this is phenomenal. And when we discuss the beginning of this war and the Western attitude, let's be frank here, we are not um, just making statements and sharing some PR stories here. We know the conduct of the Western elites. They truly believe that Russia had a powerful army with them, um, hundreds of items of uh, high precision weapons and the Armada tanks, and they, it, it was all still T-64 rusting and so forth, and no professional professional C2 structure, C4, and the two components uh, um, uh, were uh, not true, and that distorted all the projections because the Russians uh, wanted to take our country within three days, and the West believed it. And uh, at the beginning, at the onslaught of this, all the parties expected a tragedy, with the only exception, let's be Frank here, the presidential office in Ukraine, the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine, the parliament of Ukraine. And indeed, we had some um, uh, panic. Um, 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 we um, uh, anxiety about the process, but people were doing their job. Coming back to normal uh, with this understanding that uh, nobody can do it for us. And the second component is the complete disintegration, economic disintegration of Russia. They steal like crazy. So they have no supplies, no logistics. And this is another bubble that they inflated themselves and they I truly believe that this is going to work. Um, we realized that too, and we uh, knew that we had to repel that first blow, very powerful. Nobody um, expected uh, 16 um, regional capitals to be attacked by cruise missiles. And um, very few people in the Western elites uh, can realize what um, this missile impact is without any mandate, unprovoked, just launching. And on the T-22 over the Caspian Sea, launching 16 missiles against 16 regional capitals, cruise missiles. And that prevented any kind of uh, correct reaction for the first days. Everything having to do with the Russian propaganda, for us to understand. 2014, but on another scale, let's take this uh, Zaporizhia and PP, nuclear power plant. What the Russians are doing, uh, they in a very monotonous way, they um, uh, very insistent. They say all the bombardments come from the Ukrainian side. It's the same kind of information. It's very repetitive. That's the only thing they do. But uh, this is a different scale because um, uh, foreign journalists um, use this information because they have to be unbiased. They have to do two sources contradicting each other. And um, one of them is Russia. And they say, look, we do not know where they come from. Perhaps Ukraine. And uh, this is being repeated. And we have this primitive, elementary, not propaganda, but um, advertising. This is all about money. They love money. They're, they're money-loving nation and money-obedient nation. They love to steal from uh, their own treasury. They do it uh, with great passion. 800 millions to buy uh, some kind of uh, stately house at Como, the Como Lake. Um, be, um, before the war, this is the right strategy, I think, for Ukraine at least. And when we, for the first time, arrived at the talks, and uh, I saw that key on the 28th of February, I believe that they were not our position in terms of uh, quantity they were, but not intellectually. They uh, degraded, they're debilitated. They have no Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It used to be a great diplomatic school, Imperial and then Soviet. Uh, but uh, I saw people who didn't know the Ukrainian status, what na national battalions were supposed to mean. And, um, 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 and um, uh, those were the elite, or supposed to be, again, uh, they um, uh, kick uh, the door to Putin's office. Uh, 
presumably, but when you put a direct question to them, they have no answer for it. This is one of the technologies. The Ukrainian president is direct, uh, and we have the mandate uh, to be quite uh, genuine and frank in our approach and be straightforward um, defending the national interest. And then that was, um, of course, um, a beautiful game, but uh, at the first stages it was just genuine. In this room in Washington or New York or many European capitals, I think it's easy to think that the information space is uh, relatively free of Russian disinformation or some of these, uh, some of the lies, as you put it in. I think there are a couple of areas where um, this is probably going less well from the Ukrainian perspective. One is uh, within Russia itself, where I think many of us have been surprised by the apparent level of support, or at least indifference, about um, ab about the war, though that's not, of course, what they call it there. The other is in uh, what um, Radek Sikorsky mentioned in the previous session. Uh, in the developing world, where I think this has been a more a more complicated discussion, and where some of these messages have been a little bit less successful, and let's start with with Russia. Is it your sense that the level of support or indifference is as as high as it appears from the outside, and are there things that Ukraine and the U.S. and other partners can be doing to more effectively shape the information space there? So I think it's first of all important to understand that there is no such thing as public opinion in Russia. Um, and I mean, I mean literally it doesn't exist. So people don't have opinions in a, in a, in a profoundly authoritarian society the way we do here. Um, so whatever, first of all, nine out of 10, so for a person I know who does polling in Russia, says that nine out of 10 people asked to contribute to an opinion poll don't respond. So that's already 90% of the country that doesn't want to express an opinion in public at all. Um, of the people who do respond to polls, um, all of them know that, for example, saying anything against the war or even calling it a war or saying anything against the president could immediately mean they go to jail. Um, and so the way that people speak and the way they express themselves um, y you know, is an attempt to conform. I mean, secondly, there, there used to be in the Soviet days an expression called speaking Bolshevik. And that meant that people would speak Bolshevik in public because that's the way you speak if you wanna, if you wanna get along in society. And so you have this phenomenon again now. So people will say whatever it is that you need to say in order to get through the day or do your job or whatever, and it means nothing um, about what they, what, what they think. I mean, I suspect the truth is that most people um, are, uh, are alienated from the public sphere and they don't take any part in it at all. In other words, it's not that people support the war, it's that the, the, the Putinist propaganda, which, as I said, was des is designed to disorientate people and designed to make people apathetic, that it has worked in that sense, that people feel the world of politics and is ugly, I don't know anything about it, I don't want anything to do with it, and I stay out of it. I suspect that's most of, of what people think. Um, and so therefore, when you talk about reaching Russians and so on, you're talking about reaching people who have decided not to care about anything. Um, and that's a much more difficult than a, you know, you know, so this is not a public that is engaged in the way, even the way, you know, lots of comparisons made to Nazi Germany, but they aren't e engaged and going out on the street and running, entering pro-war demonstrations. Instead, they're apathetic. Um, I mean, I do think that, I mean, there are, as, as people know, there are a number of projects designed to find ways to reach Russians. Um, it's very difficult now because almost all um, forms of communication have been cut off, but they, most of them operate on, you know, again, looking simply to engage people or to transmit information, um, sometimes to, you um, uh, you know, so, sometimes to play on, um, you, you know, national emotions. So aren't you angry that we're losing the war? Aren't you angry that we're not winning and so on? I, those are all experiments and I don't know how well, they'll, how well they will work out. I mean, the, 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 main, the main goal, I think, should be just simply to engage Russians with the awareness of the war and understanding with what's happening as much as possible. Mikhail, let me let me put that question to you. Do you see any way to influence Russian views here 
And then as you look to the rest of the world, and especially what is uh, likely to be a kind of difficult stretch ahead, whether it's, you know, um, energy prices during the European winter or continued struggles around uh, food prices globally, uh, are, are, there, are there things that worry you as you look to this next stretch? Well, we have a very powerful argument for the Russian Federation, the armed forces of Ukraine in their own rights, and uh, they will understand someday, I'm sure. But we uh, should make no mistake about the uh, Russian Federation and what is going to happen next. They will never accept it even if they lose. This is a deeper problem. Uh, we are actually concluding the things that uh, remained unconcluded uh, in early 90s and mid 90s. There was no uh, repenting, there was no rethinking of uh, the past, uh, like in the rest of Europe. I mean, the Warsaw Pact countries and so forth. Russia. Uh, no, chose the way of uh, actually fixing the situation and after Yeltsin they arrived at understanding that comfort is not for everyone in Russia and the quality of life would always be much lower than uh, in Europe and any civilized country, wealthy country. And then uh, they uh, started to uh, think about that revanchism. And now uh, they are implementing this resentment uh, with this attack in the east uh, of Europe. Uh, they hate uh, Eastern Europe most of all, and Ukraine is, is uh, the country they love to hate. And they, because this is conceptually a totally different uh, state, I mean Russia, they can only have this um, authoritarian uh, type of rule. Democratization is um, um, impossible without, repent without repentance uh, for the things you, you had done for 70 years, I mean the point of disintegration of the Soviet Union. And uh, we have this concept of the USSR to point uh, zero, uh, another version, um, uh, smaller, um, less uh, powerful, um, but we remember Afghanistan, which was a precedent, a perfect precedent. Now Russia is selling one concept to the citizens, the imperial um, grandeur. You and uh, you can, uh, I'm not talking about Moscow, St. Petersburg, or Ekaterinburg. Um, we're talking about the Russian Federation. You have no chances to be well off, uh, to uh, be successful, to have a great career. This is a um, s difficult system in the Russian Federation. How can we possibly influence it? Uh, um, we have to win. This is the key thing because that will make them uh, choose the path of repentance. Uh, and secondly, we have to um, uh, prove to them that Ukraine is um, a country um, to conjure with. And um, this can be um, Kazakhstan, this can be Poland, uh, this can be um, um, any Baltic state, they should understand that those are not territories that you can enter with your tanks and dictate something. Russia um, knows blackmail, and they uh, don't know any better. They say, we have this, we can weaponize it, like the energy blackmail in this situation. But this is the war, and this is not just the war um, in Ukraine. This is a, a value, a war of values. Uh, it all started with Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, when um, some countries uh, would give away 70% of their energy independence uh, as far as the natural gas is concerned, without diversifying the risks. And I'm quite shocked um, uh, when you talk to the Russian Federation, when you have colleagues, well, you do not understand what their intentions can be. This is obvious. They do not use business. 
as usual or as unusual. Uh, they, uh, their um, um, businesses, uh, raw material based, uh, they are elements of the economic system of Europe. They can make money on that uh, to make an industry of servicing, servicing uh, lobbyism, hence lobbyism, politicians getting some kind of bonus uh, for Russia being part of the energy space of Europe and in that situation presumably uh, Russia wouldn't uh, weaponize energy. No, this is a big mistake. For Russia anything is a weapon. Anything is a tool to kill and they will use it one way or another sooner or later. We are going to have this difficult stretch like you put it. Now we'll have to pay for the price uh, with the uh, utility bills, uh, um, high, uh, with higher prices, lower incomes, but this is the price we have to pay for the future economy of Europe, correctly designed. And then that's what we have to talk about. Yes, three degrees lower the ambient temperature should be, but for 12 million people in Ukraine, there is no home to speak of. And quite frankly, I would lo and I keep saying this to Europeans. We are prepared to pay the price because this is extremely important. In mid term, long term, in, and we have to be a free sovereign country that is in position to set the rules for its own existence, not some Russia coming and bossing around or any other totalitarian country, authoritarian coming and saying, we have more tanks, you see, so you better behave yourselves. No, this is not the case. This is the price. This is the um, percentage. Um, uh, some um, drop uh, of incomes and uh, wealth. Uh, but uh, the war actually started, in my opinion, uh, if you take the, the concept uh, of uh, Angela Merkel's, it started in 2008 when Russia was named the key energy partner. So let's pay the price. It's difficult, but we'll pay together. We'll share the cost. I want to close by going to a couple other. We have joining us remotely from Germany, I believe, uh, Mikhail Zigar, who is a, a Russian journalist who left shortly after the war after uh, starting a, a petition to protest. Uh, Mikhail, please tell us a bit about your perspective on the information space generally, but especially on where you think um, views on the war, support for the war with, with, with Anne's caveat in mind uh, within Russia are and whether there's anything more that can be done to shape uh, views within Russia. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a huge pleasure for me to, to participate in, uh, in this panel. And, um, you know, you, you've discussed pretty much uh, a lot of the important issues. Uh, um, and from, for, first of all, it seems to me uh, uh, important to, um, to state that there is no way for Putin to win the information war. Um, we, we all understand that. And actually, sometimes it seems like uh, he's not waging the war because like, um, there are not many attempts to impress the West. But uh, it's very important to understand that uh, the main battle, the main battlefield outside, if we speak of the informa information war outside of Russia, the main battlefield is the global south. And for Russian propaganda, it's a very important direction. And that's, um, and they know that in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, there are people who um, do not support Russia in this war, they do not support Putin, but still they, um, they consider him to be a cool guy. He is he's popular there as probably Osama bin Laden used to be popular. Uh, that's very disturbing phenomenon, I guess. That's uh, that's not part of our today's agenda, and that that's not um, mm, uh, the uh, the threat we can address easily. Uh, but I think that that level of anti-Americanism and readiness of the global South to um, to support anyone, any country that uh, is not in line with the West mainstream, it is very disturbing. Uh, but if we speak about the, uh, the information war battlefield domestically, um, I guess uh, there is very uh, important issue and the, uh, 
the problem that is not going to be solved uh, within decades. That um, that um, it took it actually. Um, I, I was watching how the imperial resentment was growing in Russia uh, during the last years, and uh, it seems to me that actually it was very fast. Uh, um, Putin started using all of his techniques and all of his efforts to um, to create that um, nostalgia for for a great Russian empire only ten years ago. He he was not he was not that paranoid. Uh, about Russian Empire uh, in the beginning of his of his fr first presidential term, although uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine um, started that uh, that uh, mechanism. But um, after the protest rallies in uh, all across Russia in uh, 2012, that was the, the turning point when he realized that he he was going to lose power if only um, he did not change um, the way how people think. And unfortunately, he in, he happened to infect um, a lot of Russians with with uh, that imper imperialist feelings. And I guess that uh, it's going to take time for for all of us for for that part of Russian society that uh, that is fighting against the war and it's uh, and fighting against uh, against Putin sometimes outside of Russia. But uh, it's, it's going to take decades to. Um, Rethink Russian culture to think uh, to rethink and to um, reconsider um, our attitude to our history, um, to to the way how we perceive uh, Russia and how to how to teach Russian population that uh, the empire itself is the greatest threat to them. Th th thank you, Miguel. I want to go to one more perspective before we close, which I think will also be uh, a note of caution from Natalia Bogayova, who has long studied uh, Russian disinformation. Natalia, what can you tell us about what we should expect from Russia in the months ahead? Where, how will they come back to combat some of these efforts we've been talking about here? Uh, sure. So I'll mention a couple points uh, and lessons learned uh, from the first six months um, of the full invasion. First, uh, I think we still define down and narrow down the concept of Russian information space, which goes way beyond uh, troll factories and media disinformation and often encompasses physical actions to support the campaigns. For example, a Russian's blockade of grain in Ukraine's ports is intended to create information and facts to fracture the global support for Ukraine, including in the global south. Similarly, the offensive on Syrodonetsk was also an info op intended to project the power that Russia cannot sustain. So I think we need to broaden what we define as info space. Secondly, um, I will mention that Russia will increasingly become dependent on the information space because its goals remain the same, but its military capability is degrading. And we'll see Russia's efforts, and we already see them, to target one of the centers of gravity of this war is Western support for Ukraine. Uh, and we should not underestimate Russia's capability here because, look, we're, some are still discussing, uh, after all these months and years of the war, uh, whether it was about NATO territory, which is a testament to how strong and embedded some of the Russian info ops are in the West. And it should be our imperative to prevent uh, Russia info-driven erosion of Western support to Ukraine. Uh, final point I'll mention that we also learned quite a bit about Russian vulnerabilities in the information space, specifically that many of the info ops often backfire or fail. Um, and as was mentioned before, you know, one of the uh, long-standing campaigns to persuade Russians that Ukraine is a failed state actually is creating a problem for Putin, who now has to explain to his people why he needs to recruit more um, to, fight, um, to fight Ukraine. So I think we've learned quite a bit. Uh, we got better at um, stripping Russia off its informational advantage, including by uh, means like releasing intelligence. But I think we need to move further and actually start preempting a, a lot of the information operations and anticipating them way ahead of time. Well, that is a great note to end on. Uh, Mikhailo and Anne, thanks so much for all you're doing and for your comments today. This will be a, a really important space to watch, and we'll, uh, we'll all be watching with, uh, with intense interest. So thank you.